us on our active student-centered learning inspiration webinar brought to you by RELO, the Regional English Language Office with Mika Riescher and Marcella Raffo. We are broadcasting today from the U.S. Embassy in Lima, Peru. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Abigail Gary. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon in the United States. I am currently working in Lima in La Universidad Antonio Ruiz de Montoya in Pueblo Libre. And my name is Kat Huang. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. in the United States. And I'm a current Fulbright ETA working at the Universidad de Tecnología y Ingeniería. And my name is Lisa Boche. I'm originally from New Jersey. And I'm working here in Lima at La Universidad Femenina del Sagrado Corazón in La Molina. And so basically we are Fulbright English Teaching Assistants, which um, Fulbright is the flagship exchange program from the United States, um, sending hundreds of um, Fulbrighters to different countries to teach English and assist in um, different communities around the world. So we're here working at our universities in Lima assisting their English programs. Great, so we're all English teachers and uh, part of that experience is we like to keep our students engaged. So now we're going to go through the Citrix software that we're all using for the webinar today. And we're going to practice here with some of the functions for engaging in our webinar. So first we'd like to show you that you can, you have your console here on the right hand of your screen and you're welcome to Collapse that if you like, if it's uh, in the way. You're also um, able to use a chat box. So that function we can practice right now. Um, you can see that on your right. If everyone could say hello and tell us where they're joining us from, you can see that everyone's able to use the chat box. This area will also use to answer questions that we'll have throughout the presentation for the webinar. All right, now you'll see that on the little bar, the vertical bar, you can have use the hand raising function. It's got a little hand with an arrow on it. So we'll practice if everyone could try raising their hand. Great. Okay, now we're going to move on to the polls. We'll have several polls throughout the presentation um, to get an idea for what everyone thinks of our questions and their opinions. So, this seminar, um, we do not have any specific handouts. But if you are interested in reviewing the PowerPoint presentation once again, you'll be able to contact Relo at the email provided at the end of the PowerPoint, and we'd be more than happy to send this along your way. Um, throughout this seminar, we'll also be doing some surveys. We'll be asking for your guys' feedback. If this is you know, an active presentation, we would love if you guys were active here with us. OK, great. Well, to kind of kick it off, we want to jump right in. We'd love to hear from you all. Um, how many of you are familiar with student-centered learning? If you could raise your hand, we'd love to get a count. OK, we're going to wait till we get some, some hand raising in. OK, it looks like we've had a fair amount of hands raised from the group. Thank you so much. That's good to kind of know that people are already familiar with the topic. Um, student-centered learning is very important, and that's why we are excited to share with you. So here I have two diagrams to kind of show a little contrast between teacher-centered learning and student-centered learning. On our left, we have a diagram about the teacher-centered learning. As you can see, everything is driven from the teacher. The teacher, with their knowledge and their experience, is imparting this or sharing this with the class, where the class is kind of absorbing this information. This, you know, can be helpful for audio learners, but it can be tough to capture the attention of the students and to maintain it throughout. On the other side, though, we do have student-centered learning. You can see there's a lot more happening with this diagram. The student, the focus is on both the students and the instructor. 
the instructor is modeling, where the students are also interacting. Students aren't only learning from the teacher, they're learning from each other, which is really great because you know, with the diversity of students in your classroom, you're going to have a really different variety of, of experiences that can be shared. This also is going to create a lot more engagement with your activities. Um, and students are going to feel ownership over their learning because they're actively participating, they're engaging, and they're helping each other as well, really creating this sense of community, which is exciting to see in the classroom. You'll see sometimes, as it says below, the classroom can be noisy and busy as opposed to you know, quiet on the teacher center side. But that's a good thing, especially in English classes. That means there's a lot of student talk time, which we love. The more practice, the better. Students are also really able to evaluate their own learning as well as the instructor and really kind of engage in this topic of English. We want to do another quick survey for all of you out there. So keeping this in mind, which of the following activities is an example of student-centered learning activity? Is it a teacher reading out loud? Is it students working in groups? Is it students playing a game of bingo. If you guys could respond, take a moment, reflect back, think about those diagrams that you just saw. Looks like we have some answers still coming in. Wonderful, I see some great responses. Good, well it looks like everyone got this answer correct, which is so exciting. And the key word in this is obviously students. So nobody picked a teacher reading out loud to her students because that wouldn't be student-centered. Students working in groups to teach the class new vocabulary, that's awesome. Students really engaging in the work. They're leading the class and learning from each other. Students playing a game of bingo. As well, that is you know, more student-centered, that they're actively involved. It's most likely the teacher who's leading the game while the students are just following. Ideally, if you could get the students taking turns, maybe reading off the bingo cards or coming up with that, making them more involved, you could make that activity even more student-centered, which is, as you've seen, always the goal for us. Great. Well, now I want to transition a little bit to, and with this model of student-centered learning, let's talk about what kind of activities you can use to actively engage your students. So we have another quick survey. In your opinion, which of the following activities will help your students learn and retain the most information? First off, we have got reading. Second, we have listening. And third, we have watching. So if you guys wouldn't mind taking a moment, maybe reflecting on your experience in the classroom. Um, what, do you, what have you seen being effective within your classroom? Um, helping your students really to kind of learn and retain, which is super important in English language learning, all of these questions, all this new information that they're receiving. Are they reading a handout? Um, are they listening to, to a, you know, a voice recording? Are they listening to a conversation? Or are they watching a fun YouTube video? A lot of different ways that they can engage in all three of these activities. Um, looks like we still got some responses coming in, which is wonderful. As, as teachers ourselves, it's really exciting to hear from other teachers and to, to hear what you guys think well, works well. So it looks like we got a little bit, okay. And so now our poll is just now closed out. And with a 76% we got watching, 52% said listening, and then with the least here on reading. So it looks like you guys were exactly right. Watching is heavily favored in terms of learning and retaining the most information. I now want to reference the learning cone and talk a little bit about active and passive learning. So if we stop, look at the front of this pyramid, at the top, we see the first thing is reading. If you note on the side, you'll see that after two weeks, we only remember 10% of what we read, which is really quite little. 20% um, of what we hear, which is better, so hopefully you guys will remember 20% of this. Also watching, 30%. And then as we get more and more involved watching a video, and then we pass into active learning. You're participating in doing. You're involving a discussion. You're, pre you're presenting. You're simulating real life circumstances. Students are having fun. They're engaging in the material. And they're really getting more involved. 
not necessarily rote memorization, but actually getting involved in different types of activities that stimulate different types of learners. So keeping this in mind, I want to pass over to Kat now, who's going to speak a little bit to what skills students can be using within these activities. Great, so this is Kat here. Um, we'd like to share with you another great resource in focusing on student-centered student learning in your classroom. Um, this diagram shows Anderson's taxonomy, or Bloom's taxonomy revised, which represents this, the domains of learning. So what we want to focus on here in the classroom would definitely be the upper levels of this diagram, which are applying, analyzing, and evaluating, and creating. So at the bottom, we have remembering and understanding. And a lot of, all of these levels are essential when learning anything, but especially learning a language. Um, but as you can see on the right here, the list of verbs show that at the bottom levels, the students will be focused on defining maybe vocabulary words or memorizing a vocabulary list and repeating. And then above that, we have describing, identifying, or simply translating. Okay, so apologies for that pause there. We had a technical difficulty. But as I was saying, we really want to focus on and emphasize uh, using these upper four levels in your teaching when you're focusing on student-centered learning in the classroom. So having students demonstrate their knowledge, illustrate, um, you know, actively demonstrating their understanding of the new information. Um, in the, the analyzing section, you know, examining new information, differentiating, and then moving even higher, supporting an argument in a new language, and then creating, which would be the highest form of thinking that we want to be striving for um, when presenting new information. And, focusing on student-centered learning. Great, so we'd like to do another survey. Um, so keeping that diagram in mind, which of the following is an example of a creation activity? So again, that highest level of Anderson's taxonomy, domains of learning, was creation or creating. So for our options here, we have labeling a diagram with body part vocabulary, Oops. using vocabulary words to write a personal narrative, reading a text and highlighting unknown words, or playing charades. Great. Looks like we've opened up this survey here. So we really want to be thinking of creation, producing. Great, excellent responses. <laughs> We're going to leave it open just a little bit longer. Great, yes, think, think about your experience in the classroom. What kind of activities do you use? What's worked well? Great. Excellent, OK. Got some excellent responses coming in here. Excellent. Well, it looks like most of you answered um, correctly. So using new vocabulary words to write a personal narrative is um, definitely the correct response here. We've got 67%. Um, and why, why would this be? So the students would be taking the information that they've learned in the classroom and producing a new product, um, which is exactly what creation would be. Um, labeling diagram with uh, body part vocabulary, no one responded. Um, excellent, because that would not really produce, be producing anything new. Reading a text and highlighting unknown words. Had a few responses there. Um, this activity would maybe demonstrate that they haven't highlighted known words, but they're not, again, not producing something new or creating anything um, new with that knowledge. And then playing charades may be uh, categorized in the applying part of that diagram with the circles, uh, applying their knowledge through, uh, you know, drama or illustrating that. But again, we want to focus on creation and producing a new product with the language.
Okay, so I am going to talk about some examples on activities you can use in your classroom to get your students um, using those higher level activities like creation, but also focusing on student-centered learning. So the activities are coming from the students. Um, so the first example we have is jigsaw. Um, so basically I'm going to explain this with words and then I will show you a diagram on how it works. So um, actually let's start by if you can answer in the chat box with how many students you guys have in your classroom. If you could just type into the chat box and let us know um, what your classrooms look like in terms of how many students you have in your rooms. Okay, so it looks like some of you have answered. It looks like some people have some pretty large classrooms, so that's great because this example is perfect for those classrooms with higher numbers. So the first step you're going to take when you do a jigsaw activity is to create groups of four students and assign each group a number. Um, so each group will have an individual assignment. For example, maybe you say each group is given a vocabulary set, like weather, hobbies, sports, and they need to create a story using these vocabulary words. So you'll give those groups time to work and create their story. After the groups have worked, you'll rearrange them so that you form new groups, and each of these new groups will include exactly one member from the original group. Once you have your new groups, the stories will share their stories with their group members, hopefully giving them new information. So that's a, that way the person who learned about weather now is also learning about hobbies and sports through their fellow classmates. So if that's a little much, I'm going to show you a quick diagram. So you can see here we have three groups. So these would be your starter groups. Each have four different students, and you would assign each of these tables a different activity. Once you've given them time to work, you'll move them into four new groups. So you can see here that we started with um, these students over here. We're going to move them so that each new group includes a group member from number one, from number two, from number three. So that way they're sharing the learning amongst themselves. Remember the idea of student-centered learning is that the learning is coming from the students. They're teaching each other. So this is a great way to get your students moving around the room. This is a great way for your students to get them talking, which is also important in an English class. And it's a great way for the students to feel real ownership, like Abby said earlier, over their lesson. So the next activity I'm going to talk about is a gallery walk. So this is something that I use frequently in my classroom because I love it when my students get up and move around. So this can be done a number of different ways. Um, first thing you're going to want to do is create spaces around the room with maybe questions um, on big poster paper or visual writing prompts. Like you can see in this picture, you have students looking at different visuals. Um, and then you allow your students to stand up, bring their writing utensils, and you add the, allow them to make comments or respond to the questions or visuals around the room. So you can do this a number of different ways. Maybe you provide them with sticky notes and allow them to go put their thoughts on the paper, or um, you allow them to write directly on the poster depending on what kind of questions you're asking or depending on the visual you give. And then lastly, like we said, it's student-centered learning. So the learning should come from them. So we also would want to have a debrief after this. So maybe in this activity, the students are looking at pictures of immigration, quotes of immigration, so you allow them to make their own comments privately. Maybe you have a silent gallery walk, and then after they've kind of thought through on their own, then they can share with their peers and kind of allow the learning to come from directly from the students. Great, so another great example is Pictionary. So how this activity works is you place students in uh, pairs or teams, depending on the size of your classroom, and you provide them with some kind of written or visual prompt. So that could be a picture or a, a vocabulary word or phrase on a piece of paper. So in each group, um, there is one person who is the artist. 
and the artist is not allowed to see the prompt. The rest of the group or team would then describe the prompt or the vocabulary word or the picture to the artist while that person tries, the artist tries to draw what they hear. Then lastly, the team whose artist completes their drawing most accurately or quickly wins. And this activity you can um, definitely modify to fit with, to be most appropriate with your classroom size, um, age, and depending on what you're, what you're teaching in that lesson. Other ideas that you could use in the classroom would be role play or skits, and that would essentially be dramatization of uh, whatever the topic is, so the students can um, take a, an example dialogue and act that out for each other. Also, students could participate in debates, taking some kind of important issue or problem or topic, and then form arguments around what they believe in or maybe what they don't believe in and um, have an educated discussion about it with each other. And lastly, one of our ideas is think, pair, share. So this involves um, giving the students a prompt or giving them some kind of assignment to think about privately um, so and quietly. So in the classroom, the students will get have a few minutes to think about the prompt and then after a few minutes they're they will discuss it in pairs with their partner share their ideas and then at the end they will share so they'll share with the rest of the classroom and this really works well for um, the more shy students all right so we'll use the chat box again so we'd like to uh, know if you have any other ideas that could be used to facilitate st active student-centered learning in the classroom. Try to think of anything that you've used that has um, facilitated this kind of learning. Great. Looks like we have some excellent answers coming in. Lots of experience with student-centered learning. Yes, this is great. Lisa, what do you like to do for, for active student-centered learning in your classroom? Um, so I love to use, I think in a language classroom, storytelling is an awesome way oh, to get yeah. students um, engaging. They love to talk about themselves. Obviously, they're <laughs> students. So anytime you can get them to tell a personal narrative, um, do something like that, they always um, seem to enjoy it. It looks like we also have, yep, making them talk about topics of their interest. Role play is great, um, especially if maybe you make them tell stories and then you have them act them out in the, that role play um, setting. Um, Hangman, there we go. The letter card. Sketching a diary situation. I think that's really wonderful also trying to involve you know, students who might have other talents or who might learn in different ways. Always important to keep that in, in mind as well um, while you are uh, designing your activities. We do want to give some space now quickly to ask some questions. So if there are any questions or things that came up, um, within our seminar or you know, things in general you would like to ask uh, about student-centered activities or active learning. We don't unfortunately have much time, but we'd love to hear a couple questions. So one of our questions that we received was, do we receive a certificate after the webinar? And oh, we do not, um, unfortunately, do not award certificates for the webinar. We are so excited, though, that um, all these teachers have chosen to join us and are really interesting on developing themselves as professionals and as teachers. We know that your students greatly appreciate it. Great. Well, unfortunately, it looks like we are running out of time for today. Thank you so much for all of your patience in dealing with those technical difficulties that we had. Um, 
if you could, if you want to continue to write questions, we would be more than happy to answer at the at the Reload Andy's email that we'll be sharing with you right now. Um, so next month, um, like you said, you'll you'll be receiving an email just like you received an email for this um, webinar. Next month, we will have a presenter that will talk about integrating the four skills. So you will learn all about that next month, and you can go online to register or take a look at your email. Great, and we'd also like to invite you to connect with us. So definitely try to find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Um, or email us. On YouTube, all of the webinars are posted the day after, so you're welcome to go check that out. Um, and like we said, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to post them on Facebook or send us an email. Thank you so much for joining us um, today. It's been a wonderful experience and great to connect with so many people um, joining us from all over and excited about English and how we can be better teachers for our students. Thank you once again.